Good afternoon. Welcome to the YWCA's Talk on Health. This conversation was created in order to reach people who don't normally get to ask healthcare providers questions. This project was created in collaboration with, Del with the Wilmington chapter, Wilmington alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated and the Lower Cape Fear YWCA. We welcome you to join in and ask questions um, as they arise. I'm going to begin with a land acknowledgement from the YWCA. The YWCA of the Lower Cape Fear region serves the people located within the Lower Cape Fear region. This land once thrived with life from indigenous peoples known today as the Cape Fear Indians and the Wakama Suwan Indian people. They live in established settlements along the Cape Fear River and Lake Wakama, along with many other established sites in the region. We need to protect and honor these places. Indigenous peoples are not relics of the past. They are still here and they continue to thrive um, and demonstrate their talents and gifts amidst a backdrop of ongoing colonialism and oppression. They are worth celebrating. We hope our land acknowledgement statement will inspire others to stand with us in solidarity with Native peoples. Thank you. We have some wonderful panelists here today. We have Sonia Pill, Dr. Frisk, and Amanda Ross. I'm going to allow each one of them to introduce themselves and tell what area of expertise they bring to our conversation today, which is on seasonal depression. We'll begin with Dr. Frisk. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you so much for the, for the welcome. Like Lakeisha, my name is Dr. Rachel Frisch. I'm a, a physician, a psychiatrist who specializes in disorders of the mind, mood, relationships, mental health, wellness in general. Um, I primarily focus on the medication management aspects, so like the biologic conditions that are associated with wellness and mental health issues, but I also do a degree of individual psychotherapy for my patients as well. Um, the patients that I primarily specialize in, um, I, would, I would say are, are general adults, but that includes a lot of reproductive women's mood disorders. I work with a lot of professionals, young professionals, and those transitioning in their careers, as well as young college students as well. So kind of the gamut of life transitions and hard things that come up in life. And unfortunately, the impact on all of us is the seasonal change, which doesn't matter what stage of life you're in, it's likely going to impact you in a, in a, in a big way. So within my private practice clinic, Fresh Psychiatry, I'm happy to help people on an individual level and within their families. It's good to be here. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Next, we'll have Sonia Pill. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to be a part of your talk on health. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm currently a life coach and a business consultant for Work at Girl Coaching, executive coach. I help women accelerate growth, find balance and healing in business and in life with my reposition uh, system. Before then, I've spent over 25 years in the pharmaceutical marketing sales training area. Most, most specifically, I spent the last 10 years as a pharmaceutical specialty rep and account rep in psychiatry. That was my um, specialty of origin and studying everything about the mind and um, mood disorders. And as a part of the business that I do today, I help women and families become stronger healthcare advocates for themselves and for their families with uh, part of my business was consumer health consulting business, which advocates for healthcare for family and helps to bridge the gap between the consumer and the healthcare provider within the healthcare system because there's so much that a person has to deal with that they want optimum health. The healthcare provider has responsibility, but we also have the have responsibility as the consumer. So thank you again for the invitation. Thank you for being here, Sonia. And next we have Amanda Ross. Hello everyone, thank you for the invite as well. Um, this will be uh, a good setup here, I think, um, to touch on depression um, since that seems to be the season. Um, I am an ex-elementary teacher and I have moved into the social work 
aspect of things. I wanted to do more um, to help families. At the education level, we only can do the books, but there is the mental piece to everything. And um, I was teaching elementary and I could already see what kids were going through at that point in time. So I could only imagine um, what goes on within the household. So I switched gears and um, went ahead and jumped into social work and have been working at the macro and meso levels. I have done outpatient therapy with children and adults, and I am currently just doing assessments only to diagnose um, mental illnesses or substance uses that adults have or children. And so um, I've, I'm kind of well-rounded in looking at um, everyone as a whole instead of just that one section and just trying to see what impacts their lives, what's gotten to them to that point from childhood into adulthood. So seeing that um, going across really helps put things into perspective and understand how they get to um, adult and why they do the things that they do. So um, I am here to present whatever information that I can with what I've learned so far. Thank you very much for being here, Amanda. Well, we're gonna uh, start off by defining what is seasonal depression. Anyone can join in and answer the question. I'm happy to get started since this is a, a big baseline of what I do, right? Is understand what are, what are diagnoses and, and then what do we do about them? <laughs> um, so seasonal depression, seasonal affective disorder, there's, there's a lot of different names that it goes by, and it's actually a subcomponent of other forms of depression. Um, there are a lot of folks who do have seasonal dep depression in isolation, but more often than not, what we see is a degree of worsening of baseline mood issues that come up exacerbated within the months of November to February. Um, so traditionally, what we'll see is magnified versions of low mood, changes in appetite, changes in sleep, maybe behavioral changes, social isolation, withdrawal. Um, there's a number of different reasons why it might happen, including just phases and cycles of potential bipolar disorders um, or regular major depressive disorders. Um, but oftentimes we, we correlate it with hormonal changes that take place in the seasons where it's darkest. Um, about 70% of the population will actually have something that's called subsyndromal seasonal affective disorder. So a lot of people feel the winter blues, like a lot of us, <laughs> and it's perfectly normal because it really is a response to how our body's hormones fluctuate with fluctuations in light, whether that's the amount of melatonin that our bodies have at baseline actually increases when it's so dark all the time, whether it's the serotonin uptake is changed or our circadian rhythms, how we sleep and the cycles in which we sleep. So lots of different reasons. Uh, it's a coined term from the I believe, but it's basically this winter sadness more so than the average just winter blues, but sometimes limiting your functionality as well. So how do you differentiate the, just the winter blues from actual season, seasonal depression? Yeah, it's a great question. So typically what we have to have are cyclical patterns displayed. So at least two seasons or more, or typically they'd say two of the last three seasons, you would have a reoccurrence around the same period. The time frame, specifically in, in the northern hemisphere right now, is like the November through February time frame. Um, there, there is a seasonal pattern that's summer. Um, I would say it's a lot more rare, um, depending on the continent that you live in and like the hemisphere. Summer times actually can be more of a common time frame for other folks, but um, there needs to be a recurrence in a pattern of this cycle of every year. And I'll have some patients who do say they have a seasonal component. And perhaps it really is a season with an associated trigger, like uh, like an anniversary or a holiday that might not be the winter holidays. Um, but the traditional seasonal affective disorder, by definition, is November through February seasonally associated within a pattern of across the period of span of like three seasons, at least two of those seasons. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to speak on seasonal affective disorder? I think it's important that we clarify seasonal affective disorder against moving into major depression, because um, while um, a person may have, we may think, particularly as a spouse or a mother or just someone and someone looking on, we may think, oh, he's just moody because it's the season, and we may write that off as, oh, he's just it's just the season. So I think it's um, important, wouldn't you agree, Dr. Fisher, to di differentiate between major depression and seasonal depression? Because, you know, there could be a fine line in um, recognizing each of it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think the nuanced terms that, so in, in 
the medical terminology, right? The sub syndromal that 70% of us just feel the winter blues or sad. Um, the seasonal affective disorder in conjunction with major depressive disorder, um, the, the functional limitations that come with that are generally much more than just being a slight bit sad or nostalgic around the holidays. There's a lot more involved and um, you know, around 5% of the average United States populace, populace will experience actual seasonal affective disorder. But that's a big difference between the 70% of us who just get sadness or winter blues. It's more common in women, four times more women will experience this actually younger adults, surprisingly enough, like 20 to 30 years old, um, and those with any degree of like medical or psychiatric comorbidities. So there's a lot of niche areas, niche demographics that are particularly at risk. And it's really important not to minimize or invalidate how their winter sadness might actually be pathologic and different than what all of us just might feel. Are those living in Chicago more likely to have uh, seasonal depression than people like us living in Wilmington, North Carolina, where it's still sunny? You're, you're actually, you're <laughs> right. yeah. it's, a running joke. it's a running joke, right? That is this, those the ones. Yeah. In the city, but you're not wrong. Like one of the treatments for seasonal affective disorder, we do really highly recommend that folks actually geographically relocate if at all possible yes. to one yes. or more sunshine. It's, it's a, I can it's speak a, to that. I just moved from Cleveland, Ohio. And um, before I lived in the Northwest, I didn't experience seasonal affect the I didn't I didn't I wasn't sad at all and then when um in the winter season came and it was you know it gets dark at five o'clock and then the skies are gray and then it's cold and and I was just like what what is wrong with me and then I had to recognize that it was just that that I was experiencing seasonal depression and I had mm -hmm. to recognize it and that's part of the reason I moved to North Carolina <laughs> Well, we're glad you came no matter what brought you here. So yeah. <laughs> um, can you get rid of seasonal depression? Maybe with, um, I don't know, sunlight or tanning booths or is there any way to get rid of it? I'm happy to speak up as well. I know we have some great therapists in the room also. So that's a huge component. And so I'll let you speak on that piece. But from, from a general treatment standpoint, absolutely. There, there are, well, first of all, lots of, preventive opportunities that people can really self-protect, um, as one of our members mentioned earlier, to, to maintain your wellness and prevent or mitigate the likelihood that you'll fall into a seasonal affective disorder. Um, but once we do recognize some of those symptoms on coming, bright light therapy is a very effective treatment mechanism. Um, so there's these like big, large square boxes, rectangle boxes. You can buy them online at any store. Um, there are two different types. Some have UV. So like you mentioned, tanning booths, those would have UV and Regular tanning booths would not be recommended, carcinogenic, to, and there are many different negative drawbacks to those. However, um, the bright light therapy boxes, they do for dermatology uh, disorders have UV in them, some of them, but for psychiatric issues, you would use a UV free um, 10, 10, um, I'm blanking on my amperes. I think it's um, Lux, 10,000 Lux is the, the intensity of the light where they're looking for and around 20 to 30 minutes a day sitting in proximity to that bright light. So they're not terribly expensive online. They're definitely worth their weight in gold if it keeps you from having to take medications or miss work days or get worsening like immune system, physical illness in response to your, your compromised immune system with mental depression that comes along as well. Um, so about 23 minutes a day, you don't have to stare at the light. A lot of my patients think they have to just sit there staring at a bright light. I don't recommend that for your retina, um, but really just in your proximity. So if you don't work in an office with windows or get a chance to go outside often, Having that for 20 minutes when you're checking email or studying for a class or in a meeting is not only might be a nice way for you to look nice, light and bright on your Zoom camera, but more effectively will mitigate depression symptoms. On top of that, of course, we use um, traditional antidepressants, psychotherapy, and there are a lot of supplements that are over the counter that have great evidence in deterring these symptoms as well. And sometimes getting out in the morning when the sun is the brightest, getting mm -hmm. outside and breathing in some fresh air and getting some exercise will help too. Yeah, I know um, living on college campus, um, being at Fayetteville State, same thing, just I would always try to find my way outside um, to study. I always tell students that I would see them like, why do you always go in the library and be locked up? I love to be outside. Um, and that that brightens, it's something about the sun that just brightens your spirit and just um, feeling that fresh air um, makes all the difference. And so 
yeah well now that we're in our long nights and short days we definitely are going to start feeling it and it's like oh it's only five o'clock but it feels like 10 o'clock so um when that onset happens um you know I even changed the light bulbs in the house I'm like why does it feel so dark in here you know and I got higher watt wattage so that um it feels bright and so we're not walking around feeling all gloomy so it does help Amanda, you bring up a really good point. You said something about the bright light just makes you feel better. Um, I'm a total science nerd and we have so much science behind all this is, right? So um, when we are exposed to bright light, our, the pigment in our skin actually allows us to absorb that bright light and changes, it activates the vitamin D that we have. So it provides us with vitamin D and it activates it into the active form in our body. We actually can't make serotonin without active vitamin D. So serotonin, you might think are happy hormones in our bodies. So I can throw as many pills as I want at you to try to keep the serotonin that you have, but you actually can't make it if you have low vitamin D. And unfortunately, a large part of a proportion of Americans have very low vitamin D. And even if it falls within normal limits, the low limits have shown to, to proven um, correlated, correlating with really severe depressive episodes actually. So there's, there's good science behind that from a vitamin D and serotonin standpoint, as well as the melatonin. So um, you might all recognize like melatonin gummies over the counter, little tablets or gummies that you can take right before bed an hour or two and it helps you kind of wind into sleep. Melatonin is what sets our circadian rhythm. And we have this tiny little pineal gland at the back of our brains that when our retinas, when our, when our eyes view light and that they view dusk, they view the, the lowering of light in the day, it, it, it secretes, it has our pineal gland secrete and activate melatonin secretion. So when it's dark, more melatonin. Um, you don't necessarily want to be dosing yourself with melatonin gummies during the day when you want to be active and studying. And unfortunately, when it's dark outside all the time, our retinas and our pineal glands get confused and we do have a lot of melatonin throughout the day, which kind of compounds the issue. Would you recommend taking a vitamin D supplement during this time? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I love me some vitamin D. <laughs> <laughs> It's there. You're surprised. It's surprising actually how few people take vitamin D and recognize the benefits of it. Um, I don't care about that brand you get. It doesn't really matter. They're not really all that well regulated through, you know, online stores or, or in-person stores anyways, but vitamin D2 or vitamin D3, um, 1000 to 2000 international units at least a day. And if you are known to have low vitamin D, of course, check with your physician, but 5,000 international units, um, is, is what's recommended for moderate or, or at least conservative vitamin D deficiency, which most average Americans do have in the winter months. So you mentioned um, antidepressants and um, as, as a family physician, a lot of times when I start people on medications, they wanna know if they can ever get off. So talk, can you talk about how long people would have to take antidepressants for seasonal affective disorder and if they would have to be weaned off of the medication? Well, I apologize, Dr. Jared. I didn't, I, I didn't, I was, I forgot that your title of the family physician. I'm sure you see a lot of my patients for sure as well. We share how <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a huge fear that we have, isn't it? In our populations that we work with is people are just terrified to get these pills because they're afraid they're never going to get off of them in their life. And I tell folks like, yes, I went to school for a long time for pills and to understand them, but my goal is to never have to use them for long if we can. Um, there is actually a lot of evidence that we should be doing more medication trials in terms of removing them once they are established, because for the most part, once we do have some maintained stability in someone's mood, we can, we can take those meds off and or at least reduce them greatly. And the evidence tells us that unless we've had severe recurrence, the risk of recurrence um, is not as on hundred percent where it's really likely that you're not going to need them again, just because you've had one episode. If someone has had two or three episodes lifelong and they're pretty severe, it's possible that you may need these medications lifelong, but the majority of folks are not like that. With seasonal affective disorder specifically, um, we will oftentimes use these medications only for the winter months. Between November and February, you're on a dose of an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, um, or you're just at a higher dose for those months to protect yourself when you already have baseline levels. The most common medication that we will use that's FDA approved for SAD or seasonal affective disorder is actually Wellbutrin, which doesn't quite fall into our regular SSRI class. It's a little different, different happy hormones, it's norepinephrine and dopamine, which when you think of dopamine, it's that like happy hormone, like, oh, I want more of that. I kind of think of like, like penny slots. You pull once or, or the infinity scroll on TikTok. Like you see one thing, oh, I want more of that. I want more of that that motivating kind of addictive motivation um, hormone. And then norepinephrine, all of us, or a lot of us do like our caffeine a little bit. And it's like norepinephrine energy, get up and go. So you put those powers combined 
a lot of people can feel more superhuman than they than they otherwise would in the sluggish hibernating months. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is seasonal affective disorder worse than regular depression? I don't think it's any worse. Um, it, it can, I think that if people can't get out of that seasonal and we're out of, okay, it's winter, we're getting ready to go spring, we're thinking about birds, flowers, planting, that sort of thing. And people are lagging behind is what I would say. And they're just like, well, I still feel depressed or I still feel like this. And then it's at, at my level, it's just more so, okay, well, what's causing that? Is there anything traumatic? Is there um, a, a, a mental health illness? Is life not going the way you thought it would? You know, what kind of life changes are occurring? Um, I think that's how it kind of just flows into major depression. Um, but seasonal can be just as it is. It's just seasonal. Yeah, it's just winter time. Everybody dreads the winter time. But if you find the bright light of it, it's, you know, winter. If we, if we get snow here, I'm from Connecticut. So this is all still new for me, even 10 years later after being here. But um, I enjoyed seeing the snow. I enjoyed being out in the snow, um, still being outside. Whereas here, it's like, oh, my gosh, the snow is coming. And I, now I got to run kind of thing. So instead of embracing it, more so just hibernating. and. Um, so I feel that, you know, I, I tell outpatient clients that what else is the, what's the underlying of everything? Why do you feel like you can't get out of it? Um, what, is, what are those causes? And those are the things at my level that we're looking for. And then we can treat appropriately um, and, 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 and give them those resources to either work or find something to volunteer, um, get outside, get out of their comfort zone and pushing them, um, especially with COVID, uh, it's, it's entrapped a lot of people and put them back in their boxes. So at this point, we're trying to break everyone back out of that and just say, it's okay. You know, now we've got flu season. Great. You know, we already knew that after everybody was clean. It's going to get back the same way it was before. So um, covering those anxieties that people have and um, trying to assimilate back into society. Um, so things can be overcome unless there are underlying issues. I would also piggyback on that and say seasonal active disorder, truly the only way it differs by definition um, is, is kind of the etiology, right? For, for seasonal affective disorder, it's so hormonal and environmental based. And uh, the presentation can look the exact same, right? Major depressive disorder, like the, the title, which in our line of work in mental health, right? So much of what we do is, a, is semantics of like, what do we call this? More important to me is the symptoms. How does it feel? What's presenting? So the symptom presentation looks pretty similar. A lot of people are very low energy, um, very high appetites or binge eating or stress eating like carb cravings, um, very low motivation. Like I said, social isolation, low mood, sadness, maybe tearfulness, um, sluggish. The presentation is the same actually as what regular old major depressive disorder is. The difference is that there's a sub, it's like a specifier. If this is major depressive disorder with seasonal patterns. So it's the season itself. It's the hormone changes that happen during that season. What we have to be really careful. And I think unfortunately a lot of um, clinical providers might confuse is that it's just the season and the things that change in the season make it stressful. So therefore it's seasonal affective. Um, seasonal affective disorder or seasonal pattern of depression is not actually correlated. You can't define that if it's if the triggering causes for the depression are like seasonal unemployment or seasonal changes in school schedule or triggers by being around a particularly traumatizing family dynamic. Or um, if there are, are environmental stressors that are have nothing to do with the seasonality, more so with the, the pattern of the environmental exposures and the changes of what happens in that environment, um, that's just like any major depressive disorder presentation is the same, but it's all about the etiology of how it got there. Because let's be honest, some of those patterns, whether it's in the winter holiday seasons or it's 4th of July, you might be exposed to the same things and the seasonal patterns might not be seasonal just during those winter months. But I was going to ask you about that because I know a lot of people do have some holiday blues so um, and how that related to seasonal affective disorder. So thank you for addressing that. We are busy people but Year, I'll admit, or I can imagine everybody on this panel is incredibly busy given how difficult holidays are for a lot of people. Right, exactly. Sonia, did you have anything to add to that? I, thought I, well, I, I, I would add to that. I would say when we're dealing with, um, you know, just the, the change in the temperature, the change in the seasons, 
feeling a little blue, maybe even going into season of fat disorder, is one of the things when I first moved to that northern place, my friend told me, you have to stay busy in the, you have to make yourself get out in the wintertime. Don't hibernate. Have some kind of activity that forces you out in the wintertime so you can begin to enjoy um, the benefits of things being darker. Maybe it's going, taking a ride and seeing the Christmas lights. Maybe it's going, I would, I would get a season pass to see the, to see the, uh, you know, the Broadway shows because that made me get out and made me do something in the winter times to help combat my blues. That's, that's, a, that's a really good idea too. So yeah, I have, I, I, for my patients, I work with them on like the commandments of care. Like they're like eight or 10 things that we just got to do consistently if we recognize this as a pattern problem for ourselves, especially yeah. since the highest risk are ones who recognize that they had issues in the past. So following your treatment plan, if you are somebody who does need anti-anxiety medications or antidepressants, this is not the time to be stopping those. <laughs> this is not the time to, to fall off your therapy, to stop seeing your life coach, to um, to stop exercising. No, this is the time where we follow our treatment plan and we take care of our body. We're hitting the gym more, going out for those walks and bundling up just because it's cold, doing all those things that we know can give our natural endorphins and those natural coping skills a boost. We do not turn to drugs and alcohol, even though it is so particularly risky and slippery slope at this time of year, it's everywhere. And with my patient population, I also include high sweets and just food. I work with a lot of healthcare providers and guess what's in the hospital season, like the hospital rooms during this yes. season. <laughs> my nurses and doctors that I see, there's just candy and carbs everywhere. And that is our coping skill, right? Like not yeah. all of us have the opportunity to turn to a traditional drug or alcohol. Um, you're at work, so you're turning to those brownies and it's a whole bin before you recognize it. Um, right. it's, it don't make you happy. I got to give you that. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, it's a different way of it doing it. It makes you happy while you're there eating it, but not after. It yeah, is. they're a good pick me up. Girl, we have, we have science. So my husband's a neuroradiologist, so he studies brains in a very different way. He doesn't talk to the soul all day long and he likes it that way. <laughs> um, but he, we have images um, of functional MRIs that show us how our brains light up with dopamine, with those sweets. Our brains light up. You give me Taco Bell, woo, it's fireworks because it, it's, it's, <laughs> Um, but we, we got to try to really watch how we self-treat yeah. dopamine. By the right. We have to manage our stress. So the second we start realizing that we're not feeling great, get back into that therapy, start scheduling things for yourself, not isolating. I am all for scheduling plans with friends. Um, the loyalty of, okay, fine. They're going to drag me out. Fine. I'll go versus That's, I'm going to hold yeah. back. Yeah. yeah, right. Good luck doing it by yourself. But if you're going to meet a girlfriend there or whoever, like it might happen more likely. And then starting your treatment early. If you know that you're going to have symptoms like this in November, why aren't we talking to somebody in October? Why aren't we working on those things so we have a plan in place? Um, so planning ahead and then just taking a trip, get out of the winter blues areas, go take a trip somewhere nice and warm for a little bit. So um, those of us who are in the middle of North Carolina might be coming to the beach to visit y'all for a little bit more this winter. Great. Um, is there one section of the population that is more affected than other sections of the population? I think, well, I um, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think Dr. Frisch kind of touched on that a little bit too, just saying that women in general, um, we, we are emotional creatures. So I think that that's predominantly where you see a lot of those depressions, um, because we're taking on everything, we're doing everything. And it's like, at what point do I get a break too? And and so um, in the therapy world, it's more like, what do I do? How do I take care of myself? I'm always taking care of somebody else. And that becomes a barrier, uh, barrier on, our, on ourselves. Um, working with the men population, I think they deal more with the substances um, and just trying to find their own coping skills. Because as women, we're more versatile and, and willing to do the research where men is just like, all right, what's the first thing I can get my hands on kind of thing. So that's what I've noticed um, throughout therapy and, and with working with adults is who's going to take that responsibility to take care of themselves and um, what are some things that they're putting in place? I always, always emphasize, I never understood self-care per se, even though I was doing it prior, but it's nothing like getting your hair done, nails done, um, just taking a few hours for yourself out of the day um, just to to breathe. I, I tell people, I'm like, I walk around the house, I don't even have the TV on um, because it's, you just enjoy the quietness sometimes just so that you're not overwhelmed. And so um, 
looking at it in that realm of things, um, I think women are the ones that kind of just take on everything and men are just like, well, I'm gonna figure it out. I'll just drink this or I'll just take this drug and see if that will kind of bury it as opposed to just taking it head on and then dealing with it. So it does sound like women and men can have seasonal affective disorder, but the men just aren't dealing with it in an appropriate manner. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, this is, and this is where the semantics of medicine come to play, right? It's like when you come into my office, what's the presenting issue? If I'm seeing you're drinking the most, or if I'm seeing yourself coping with like food, it's going to be called something different. This is where I get kind of frustrated with the semantics of it all. Seasonal affective disorder likely happens in both. And we don't have data that talks really about the equivalencies before it gets to something else. So we four times more likely that women are going to be diagnosed with this because they're likely coming in sooner or they're coping in different ways, or they're more worried about not keeping up in ways that they have set their expectations for the holiday performance of Pinterest presence or whatever it might be, right? So we can catch them in different stages, um, but also the men, they're probably diagnosed with that substance-induced mood disorder before we actually see them at seasonal affective disorder because they power right through it. So whether or not they might be equal, I mean, the hormones that we're talking about here, those are equal in men and women. Estrogen, testosterone, progesterone don't actually have anything to do with this. Um, so the likelihood is that we're both at big risk, but populations deal with it differently. So that's why we see it and we diagnose it more in women. Now, and that brings up am, point. Okay. am I to understand too that people with major depression are more likely to have seasonal affective disorder also? Okay. That's correct. Yeah. So 10 to 20% of those um, who have major depression will have a seasonal pattern with it. Okay. And with all this talk about male and female, it brings up a good point because um, like Amanda was saying, women, we, we're communicators. We like to talk. We talk about everything. We share everything. We talk to our doctors. Men often the time don't speak. They, everything is fine until we do a lab test. Okay. And then, um, and, and, and unfortunately with seasonal depression, there is no lab test for seasonal depression. And that's why as wives, as mothers, we need to um, look out and recognize that there's some symptoms that my husband is, eh, that are magnified right now that, oh Lord, what's going on? And be an advocate for him because he may not talk for himself. He may not even recognize it. He may be more irritable right now and angry and he doesn't know why. And as a wife, we try to get around and we fix everything to make everything perfect. But it may not be anything that has to do with us. He may be going through a season of seasonal depression, but he doesn't recognize it. So we need to kind of recognize that for him and then go to the doctor's appointment with him and say, because he'll say, oh yeah, everything's fine. And you can say, oh, hold up, wait a minute. No, it's not. You bring up a beautiful point, Sonia, just the presentation of depression. Because everyone thinks that depression looks like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. And not everyone <laughs> is just morose and down and sad affectively. Like not everyone just shows you that. Mm -hmm. High functioning, very intelligent women who, especially like working moms who have to be on all the time everywhere, um, you're going to see it differently. You're going to see it maybe more scattered, more anxiety, uh, more imposter syndrome creep through. Same thing with men, but oftentimes it is that anger, irritability. And anger is a secondary emotion, as the therapists in the room know. Underneath that is sadness, resentment, isolation, loneliness, imposter syndrome, but it's the first thing that presents. That's what you see first. So this even, again, goes back to the semantics. The name, seasonal affect disorder, acronym is SAD. A lot of times you don't look sad. You look mean, you look grumpy, you look like a Grinch. And I might not really understand that that is sadness for you. So you mentioned, Sonia, that there's no blood test for seasonal affective disorder. So how is it diagnosed? I'm gonna let the doctor take that. <laughs> So, so we actually can do lab checks, checks for the vitamin D. It's, it's a it's mechanism of like the etiology yes. of got there, right? And I do think like far too few regular docs probably check vitamin D levels, vitamin B12, because we kind of just assume everyone's low, um, which is true, but some people are like really, really low and really ought to be medicating. So in my, my patient panels, I, I really always do check vitamin D, vitamin B12, which is very correlated with energy levels. Um, of course, like thyroid hormones, Although uh, myself and probably most physicians, women, especially, right? Like when we go to the doctor, we're like, check my thyroid just in case. Is that why I'm saying why I'm tired? Right. Just check it again. Just check my thyroid, just make sure. <laughs> so you're right, Sonia, like right. these are not, these are not always explain why. Sometimes the values are perfectly normal. And so um, it's correlated. It's not always causal. Um, but we, we would diagnose it the same way that we actually do diagnose depression. So we would look for changes in sleep, changes in your interest, changes in your appetite 
changes in like your ability to physically move or want to move. So um, if you're like a really agitated, nervous person, you're pacing more, or if you are, I call it lead weight paralysis. You are just like lead in your bed watching Netflix because you cannot do anything more than that when you get home. Um, and of course, any really intrusive negative thoughts passively, in my line of work, this is a spectrum of this too, right? Passively just wishing to not wake up in the morning, wishing you didn't exist on this earth. Um, I see a lot of physicians and I have physicians who will tell me, I just wish I was a patient so I could stop or slow down and people wouldn't judge me for it or I wouldn't feel so bad about it myself. Um, that's more of that passive wish to not be alive versus that active suicidal ideation. So actively I have thoughts about what I could do to not have to be here, to not have to be doing these things. Um, so those are kind of the general ways in which we discuss and diagnose and just depression in general. And you have to have a certain number of those changes, whether they're up or down, eating more, eating less, sleeping more, sleeping less. Um, and specifically with the seasonal component, like I said, two consecutive cycles of seasonal changes where those exacerbated. And traditionally, you're not really supposed to have exacerbations outside of that. So if it's purely seasonal depression, seasonal affective disorder, it would only happen consistently like these last two years during these months and no other times. Um, I would argue that our patients don't read the books. Humans don't read the books on biology or how things are no, supposed to be. And most people do have exacerbations other times too. It just might be more common during this time. Right. So do they just wake up on April 1st and they're like, fine. Wouldn't that be great if I could go, I'm going to take home day, April 1st because it's on. <laughs> right. Well, does the um, time change, I guess the time change does affect them also, right? Absolutely. I, I would say that the, any changes in the circadian rhythm cycle, right? Like with a second, we're trying to force our circadian rhythm to be different and respond to the light in a different way. Um, I don't know about in your practice, but in my practice, I feel like the second that daylight savings time changes happens, ooh, I am just like booked. I am booked. And I think people feel it immediately. And even, um, even now, like, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's about to be two o'clock and the daylight is going to be done soon. I still have X, Y, and Z to do. So the thought of having to get errands in, you don't want to drive at night, you know, um, it sets, it sets on and even my body is still adjusting. You know, I, I can tell when it's coming and then I can tell when it's here and I'm like, gosh, it's only five 30, but it feels like eight. And, um, you know, I'm waking up an hour earlier or I'm going to bed, um, an hour earlier. And I'm just like, I have to get back into a rhythm. So um, definitely that's where that seasonal things, those seasonal things are coming in play because um, you're trying to do so much in such a shorter amount of time. And then when you get home, you're like, Ugh, I'm done. Like I can't do anything else. I'm going to lay down somewhere. So. And I think we have to think about our friends and family and patients also who don't have the means to um, force it to be different, right? Like those with means can hire a babysitter to deal with the kids so they can get more stuff done later at night or, or pay to go to a high-end gym where they feel comfortable even if it's really dark, just going to work out. A lot of patients don't have that, that access. And so the second it's dark outside, you're not leaving the house because why would you go put yourself at risk for self-care that might in turn actually hurt you if something happens out there and you don't have support. So I think asking, I'm, I'm a big advocate for like the biopsychosocial model. Not only is it not only your hormones, not only your mental health, but it's the environment you're in. It's your own psychology. It's, it's everything around you that can, that holistically creates that setup for disaster or success with somebody. And if you don't, if you don't have the means to, um, you know, go to a show or go to a movie, one of the things I would do, and I, in the winter time, it's, I would just go to the mall and walk rings around the mall. Because, you know, I don't want to be cold in the snow and the ice, or we don't get that here, here. but, you know, I don't want to be cold or in the snow and it's dark. Man, the, I, I, ju I just heard that we have the second largest mall in the USA, second only to that big one in Indianapolis. Man, that, that, that'd be an awesome track to walk around in through the wintertime because they've got those bright lights and they always got the happy mu music and a lot of people there. So that's a great place if you're feeling kind of blue and like, I know I need to do something. Get some girl, get your girlfriends together, get your guys together, get your kids in that stroller and push that baby through the mall to keep yourself active through this winter time. I also like the suggestion that Amanda made about just changing the light bulbs. And yeah. that's something that's pretty a reasonable price or ordering the light off of Amazon that you said that was um, pretty inexpensive. So um, those are things that you can do that, that don't break the bank. 
-hmm. And other inexpensive things that I, I swear I say this about a hundred thousand times a day, just sleep hygiene in general. I know we're all adults. We don't want to be treated like toddlers. We don't have bedtime, but I'm included in this. I, I, you know, I hand to God, like I am right there with my patients that like, oh goodness, if it's not tempting to just binge watch a little bit of Netflix before bed, you know, and kind of wind down and use that as my, as my way, my, my routine, it's just not great because guess what gets all confused? Our pituitary glands, or I'm sorry, our pineal glands. When we see that light from the TV, we don't know what's going on. Is it light outside? Is it dark outside? Is it sleep time? So the screens at nighttime really do have to be turned off sooner rather than later. Um, putting your phone, I charge mine when I'm at, when my sleep hygiene is not always the best. Sometimes I'll charge my phone in my bathroom. So I have to get up and go turn off the alarm. It's nice and echoey in there. So it's real loud, but it's, it's, there's a barrier between it being so easy to just check my phone and scroll at nighttime. So putting some space between yourself and those screens and just making sure that you are allowing yourself that wind down routine, regular routine of bedtime and wake up time. Um, so that you do again, set yourself up for, for success. And those don't, they don't really cost a thing actually. Mm -hmm. I do normally recommend that people don't have televisions in their bedroom, but you know, I, that falls on deaf that that falls on deaf ears a lot. Tell my husband that. I'm gonna say a doctor <laughs> recommends that we remove all television from the bedroom. Yep. Hopefully he's listening today. <laughs> What's funny about that is my kids won't even watch TV in their rooms. They come in the living room or they'll come down to our room and I'm like, what's wrong with the TV in your room? So, oh, girl, keep it that way. <laughs> so I get, I get it. Sometimes they're on their iPads and I'm like, all right, you have too much screen time. I'm like, okay, well, you can either watch TV or nothing at all. They're like, well, isn't a TV a screen? I'm like, listen, don't get smart. Okay. It's a screen, but it's not the same kind of screen. So, um, so I definitely encourage, uh, less screen time. I know statistically I looked up um, when the kids were going through COVID and how much screen time they were getting at that time, um, cu cutting them off. Um, I, I limit mine during the school week and um, it makes such a difference to push them to get outside and, and go do things. Uh, we live in the country. So I'm like, you got all the resources outside, go find something out there to do. And um, so it's the same thing as adults, you know, get outside, go with them, sit on the porch, watch the cars go by, do something that's outside of your box. I think that's the hard part, right? Adults were like, we know better. And then here we are just doing the worst. <laughs> so I'll sit yeah. out of my husband's hand more often than not right before bed. And I, I lovingly, jokingly, not so jokingly tell patients all the time, our beds are for sex and sleep, nothing else. <laughs> Subway sandwiches in there or Snapchat or like we're not doing, we're not associating that space with anything else except for those behaviors that we want in that space, right? Uh, so that's, I think a lot of people don't give enough credit to sleep because truly I can't help you fix anything in terms of your daytime unhappiness or fatigue or just um, like work-life balance or burnout. <laughs> If you're not getting the basic things you need in life, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That pyramid on the bottom of that base is your sleep, your food, your water, shelter. Do you have those basic things? Because if not, we're never going to get you feeling good. The best version of yourself at the top. And I would say, don't get discouraged. You know, try something new. Turn your screen off early. Do all these things that the suggestions that we have. But give yourself time. You know, it takes 28 days to break a bad habit and create a new one. So do it day after day after day, even though you be maybe waking up or not going to sleep. Give your body time to go through that transition so it can get to that good place and good health. Don't be impatient. And it, it's hard because we got everything at our fingertips, but we got to give our body time to readjust. I agree. So if you do everything that it, sometimes it's hard, though, to do those things when you're depressed, of course, and that's what we're talking about. So sometimes it's hard to eat healthy and to and to get sleep and to exercise. Like even um, since it's since it's been cooler, I found I used to like walk five miles, you know, three or four times a week. And now I don't even want to go outside. So, so it is, it's it's really hard to push yourself to do that kind of stuff. And that's, that's where it's important to make sure that you have that accountability with people who know you and love you well and know what's a normal fluctuation and how can they hold you accountable to those things. What I far, see far too often are people who have reached that point where they really, and I spoke with a young person last night who cannot leave the bed. They cannot leave the bed. And the idea of their parents or their loved ones just saying, it's so easy, just get up and go for a walk, go for a run. Believe right. me, I've, 
I'm not depressed and I'm not running marathons. I, that's not my coping skill, right? And so yeah. to be told to just go do those things at a certain point, it's really important to involve professionals, therapists, physicians, um, just to make sure that we can help make a plan that feels somewhat stepwise appropriate to get you mm -hmm. possible because it is, we know it is, but being guilted into it's actually not all that effective. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And before the seasonal depression season begins, like doctor was saying before, get your advocates together, right? Tell your girlfriend, I need to be accountable to someone because I know I may enter this season. It can happen year after year for me. Get an accountability partner, somebody you know you can trust and who'll be there for you before the season begins. That's a great idea, Sonia. Let's set up some lunch dates and um, yeah, some outings with your friends that um, know that you're going to have problems with that. It's a really great idea. Okay, well, we're almost done. And normally I give everyone about two minutes to leave, um, leave their parting information to the community. So <laughs> I'm going to start with you, Dr. Friss what would you like to leave with the community about this conversation? Um, so it's a big question. Um, I do think that people need to have a little bit more grace for themselves in general and acknowledge that this season is hard for many, that 70% of people have that sub syndromal. 70% of people is a lot of people. I would say the majority of folks who are walking around in this transitional winter time period are, are not feeling their best self. So give yourself and others some grace for that. And just keep your eye to the ground and keep your eye to them. When, when people say they need help, please listen, because most people are, they mean it when they're saying that no one's doing it for show or for attention. They mean it. So listen to your friends, loved ones, family, make sure we get them help if they, if, and when they ask for it and make sure that you are also taking care of yourself because you cannot care for them the way that you want to, unless you're caring for yourself first. And that would include all those preventive strategies we've talked about, as well as actually seeking higher level help if you need it. Um, happy to be of help to folks. I, I'll go ahead and put my contact information in the chat here. Um, oh, thank you. I do telemedicine so I can see anybody across the state, the state of North Carolina. I'm happy to help both individually. And if you have friends or loved ones that could be uh, of services or some help, happy to talk with them as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Chris. Sonia? Mm. I just want to encourage people that if you're ex walking through this, that this too will pass. So get the support you need while you're in this season. It won't last forever. And if you have someone who is going through this, help them walk through it, be their advocate for them. They may not even be even recognize it. So be patient with them, be patient with yourself and help support them. Don't criticize them, help support them. And like Dr. was saying, self-care for yourself because it can be hard to watch a loved one struggle and sometimes a loved one's in denial and that's even harder when you're seeing that person so make sure you're taking care of yourself during these seasons try some of these different ideas that you learned today it may be that one thing that can make all the difference for you and i'm here to tell you you're worth it you you can get better and you're worth it Winter can be the best season ever. If you do some of these things that you've learned to do today, you're worth it. Get out there and do it. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda? I'm gonna just say self-care is one of the most important things that we can um, do. Um, we hear it often, sometimes we don't understand what that actually means, but even if it's just taking 10 minutes of just that peaceful moment, um, take everything away, um, that is still self-care. It doesn't have to be something you have to spend money on, hair, nails, go into a spa, whatever the case may be. Just taking that moment for yourself makes all the difference. And outside of the doctor um, medicine, I always will say holistic is always way to go and um, embracing what we have, where we are, and just taking that in, um, supporting yourself, surrounding yourself around positive people makes the difference as well. Um, if there's family that you're close with, um, you know, and you're you're not far away, especially living in the country, hey, I wanna, I wanna come over just to get out of the house. Um, just doing those small things that don't require much make the difference. And so um, I encourage it and, you know, make it work for you during this season.
Thank you very much. I'm gonna add, don't be afraid to seek help. Um, and to remember that this is a real chemical change for people's brains. So, um, you know, don't beat yourself up or feel guilty about the fact that you don't feel well um, during the winter months, but actually seek help. Thank you all very much for coming and um, everyone have a good afternoon. Thanks all so much. Meet you all. Thank you. Bye.